Good morning, New Trail. Good morning. All right. Good to see you all this morning. We have guests, and we I see people who we haven't seen for a while. We're just excited to have you here this morning. Let's go ahead and stand up and begin worship. kids and you may be seated for a couple of announcements okay next Sunday October 16th bring a friend bring a chair weather permitting we're going to worship outside I also might add bring a blanket and a hat maybe I don't know it could be chilly but weather permitting we will be outside next week if it's too chilly then we will be in here okay um, all right today Today ends um, four, four, four H week, National 4-H week. We can't spit that out. And today we have um, May and Karina's and Annalise 4-H club that is going to participate in 4-H Sunday. So they're going to come up here, do a little skit, sing a little song. Um, so anyway, come on up, Navarra Boosters. members of the Navarre Booster 4-H Club are joining you all in the celebration of 4-H Sunday. This Sunday marks the ending of a week-long celebration of 4-H and the strong ties that make our clubs a part of our communities. First observed in 1929, the most important H heart activity of the year is the observation of 4-H Sunday. When 4-H me members gather at the church of their choosing and join others in seeking the blessing of God. The keynote of all 4-H club programs is that they are active. 4-H is a program for doers. We were involved in many, and here we want to see the club's best side and see a 4-H program that is identified. 
They try never to connect with just being Freudrich. For to be a Freudrich, to be a Freudrich means to do. It is not possible to be a farmer without planting, planting and harvesting crops or tending to livestock. To be a farmer is to farm. Likewise, to be a forager is to learn by doing and thinking. Scriptures tell us that one's thoughts determine their actions. One of the H's in our forage emblem stands for head, which we pledge to clear thinking and understanding of the way of life that, that we wish to follow. There are some people who are content to say, we are, instead of we do. We are Christians, instead of we sh do strive to live lives that are pleasing to God. The slothful servant in the parable in Matthew said to himself, I have but one talent, and therefore he did nothing with his talent and buried it in the earth. The man in the parable who was known as the rich fool said, I am rich, and then he became self-satisfied. Some people think that because our country has many resources and was founded on Christian principles, that they can live here comfortably without doing anything for anybody but themselves. That is wrong. We know that to keep America great, we must all do our part in prayer and living our lives with a heart that is loving towards God and others. One of the H's in our emblem stands for the heart, which we pledge to greater loyalty, loyalty to our club, to our community, and to our country and world in this time of uncertainty and strife. We are gathered here today as a small part of over six million young people and leaders across the country that have celebrated National 4-H Week. We choose to end our celebration with the observance of 4-H Sunday by giving thanks to our Father in Heaven for the great gifts He has given us. I now will ask all 4-H members, even in the crowd, to come forward and you can do the 4-H pledge with us. Head to clear thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living. For my club, my community, my country, and my world. Wait a minute.
as a city boy from Ohio, I never experienced 4-H. I had no idea what it was, never appreciated it. And Ohio, believe it or not, has lots of farms and farmland and, and that kind of stuff. So I never appreciated it. And I thank the parents today. Would you all, parents of 4-Hers, can you stand up and give a round of applause from our congregation? In our evil and torrid world, it's great to see young people doing things for God and country. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Today's message is on faith and unbelief. <clears throat> and uh, Brian Sawyer got thrown from a horse last week. And we went and visited him in the hospital a few days ago. And he was pretty broken. And he's back home now. There's a little bit of a miracle. He's back home. And he wanted to be here this morning to have hands laid on and prayed for. But he's just not doing really well today. So we want to lift him up in prayer. And I talked to some folks. And there's lots of folks that are dealing with health issues and, and other things. So that's what we're gonna, I'm going to pray for right now. So if you bow your heads for me, please, and join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up all those today that are struggling with health issues, with finance issues, with issues in general, issues with children, issues with parents, just issues, Lord. And I lift up all these folks, Lord. We know that we have belief in you, Lord, that you will take care of those issues. You will handle those issues in your time, Lord. I just thank you, and I thank this congregation for being here this morning. And I pray that the words that you put in my mouth to speak are heard and accepted and taken to heart, Lord. We say this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Come forth. I just got to say, I see some faces out there. I remember when my kids were in 4-H. And you kids, the people here, you got to see something. Those kids that were there are our future what leaders give them strength okay go ahead and stand up and as the offering comes we'll continue worship what a fellowship what a joy divine we need on the everlasting what a blessedness
Lord, as Paul said, we are looking forward to a sermon on faith, or the lack of faith. And uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith makes us sure of what we hope for and gives us proof of what we cannot see. It was their faith that made our ancestors pleasing to God. Because of our faith, we know that the world was made at God's command. Uh, we also know that we can see, we can be seen. What we ca what can be seen was made out of what cannot be seen. And I was meditating on that this morning, thinking about, you know, we can say we have faith in nothing. You get on an airplane, do you have faith in that? You put your money in a bank, do you have faith in that? And that's where we need to have even more faith in what the Lord can do for us. I've got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend. And he is my strength. Forgiveness and healing, his mercy's enough. Oh, and this is our home. The cross it has spoken. Death is no more. Christ is the Lord. Oh, this is our home. Thank you. 
gather here this morning to worship together, like-minded believers, sharing our time together for the Lord. This morning, Lord, I ask you to be here with us, your Holy Spirit to be present with us today, Lord. Wash away all the doubt, wash away all the fear, wash away all the unbelief this morning, Lord. I just ask you to be with us, and with those that cannot be with us today, Lord, we ask your healing on them, Lord. Keep us safe and sound, and we're very blessed to have the group of young people with us again today, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Children, you're dismissed to go to Sunday school. If you have Bibles or your Bible on your phone, please turn to Mark 9. We're going to be looking at Mark 9, 21 through 27 this morning. Mark 9, 21 through 27. You're welcome. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And oft times it cast him into a fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter him no more. And the spirit cried, and rented him sore, and came out of him, <clears throat> and he was as, as one dead insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. This morning we're going to be looking at a tragic and desperate story of a father whose child has been possessed by demon for quite some time. And it says since he was a child, so we're left to understand that maybe he was a teenager or a very young adult. And it's like everything that this father has tried through the years, all the alternatives to get this child healed has failed. Now he believes in the power of Jesus. He'd heard about Jesus, and he believed there was a power, but he really wasn't quite sure. He was really conflicted. How many times have we been conflicted about the power of Jesus? How many times have we just sat and, and wondered and, and believed on Jesus? All the confidence and in the hope in his life have just been knocked out by years of trying to get some healing for this young man. Till he cried out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But listen, this is a spoiler alert. This story has a victorious ending. Jesus proves himself to be more than sufficient for this cause. But we're going to take a, a, a little bit closer look. But where is the best place to take our woes? Where is the best place to get things handled? Right at the feet of Jesus Christ. You know, in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, we're told that Jesus and three of his disciples went up to on the top of a mountain and spent some time up there. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration. They spent some time up there, and they were, they were given witness to some glory of Jesus. And when they came down, they were met by a large group and Mark tells us and when he came to the disciples he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them arguing with them immediately when they saw him all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him and he asked the scribes what are you discussing with them then one of the crowd answered and said teacher I brought you my son 
who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast him out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Key words here. Bring him to me. That's the first part of the story. Bring him to me. How, far, how often do we fail to bring our problems to Jesus Christ? Do we think he's too busy for us? Are we too self-sufficient? From childhood. He said from childhood, and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can, but if you can, he's talking to Jesus. He knows who Jesus is. But if you can, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And we skip down a little bit to the disciples. And his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this, can, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I love to preach a story like this. I just love to preach this. It just brings home a lot of things in my own life. Jesus answered the father's cry and delivered his son. He answered him. Even when the, the, the father said, I have some unbelief. When everything else, nobody else could help this father. Jesus did. It wasn't that prayer and fasting, it's not, those aren't magic tricks. The father brought his son to the only person that can help him after going through the disciples. What do we do? And I keep going back to that because there seems to be a theme through here. What are we doing with our health? What are we doing with our finances? Who are we trusting? Who are we believing in? Sometimes we're believing in the world around us. We're be believing in society. We're not believing in Jesus, but in John 15, he talks about it. He says in John 15, 1 through 8, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You already, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered. And they that gather them throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Let me read that again. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Let's look at, uh, let's concentrate on Mark 9, 20 through 24, if you still have your Bibles open. Now, when I was preparing for this message and reading this over and over and over, I really felt the depression and the anxiety that this father was going through. And I'll bet you nobody can raise their hands in here when they think about dealing with their own children, if you've got children, or dealing with loved ones, or dealing with family members. In 22, verse 22, when he brought his son to Jesus, he says, Have compassion. 
compassion on us and help us. He was, it wasn't a him thing. It was us. He's asking for help for us. Not just his son, but himself. You know, I think there's a lot of things that we can look at when we bring the needs of a loved one to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I love this person so much, and it it hurts me to see them in their pain. And I think we can also identify with this sense of internal conflict over these issues. And right now I want to talk about Brian for a moment and my failure to believe. Brian was thrown from a horse a week ago. Severe back injuries, severe rib injuries, and many other things. And we went to visit him in the emergency. And I opened the curtain and walked in, and what I saw was a man physically broken. And I asked Brian if I could do this today. I asked if I could bring him up. I saw a man physically broken, but I also saw a man spiritually broken. He toiled with this for quite a while. We talked to him, ended up laying hands on him and praying for healing for him. And I have to be really up front. When I left, I thought he's not coming out of this hospital anytime soon. Those injuries were pretty severe. And guess what? He's home. He wanted to be here today to be prayed over and laid hands on, but he's still in quite a bit of pain. Where was my belief in my prayer? wasn't there, was it? And I'm not ashamed to tell you. I'm ashamed that it happened. But we all can go through that unbelief. What that man is saying is, Lord, I believe you can help us. I've been to everybody else. I've been to your disciples, and they can't help. Nothing has helped, Lord. And those scribes were arguing and debating with the disciples. Your disciples don't seem to be able to answer these problems. Mocking the disciples. These are Jesus' disciples. He's taught them everything. He sent them out. This man is saying, I want to believe, but my faith keeps getting in the way, and it keeps getting me knocked over. I keep getting disappointed. Questions keep popping up. And I don't think I have anything left. You're my only hope. He's saying that his soul is weary beyond words. How many of us have been dealing with issues, health issues specifically? And it just drags you down. You go to the doctors, they give you pills and nothing helps. You go to the doctors and he prescribes physical therapy and it doesn't help. Maybe it helps a little bit. Pain pills only cover up and mask the pain. Not curing you. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Unbelief isn't unusual. Doubt is not unusual in the scriptures. We'll just take a look at a couple of them here. John the Baptist. John the Baptist struggled with doubt and unbelief when he was in prison. He wondered if Jesus was really the Messiah and what happened. Jesus allowed some of his followers to wander around with him. And then he said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended of me I want you to think about something are you offended by Jesus Christ I know you're sitting in a church this morning with like minded believers have you had the opportunity to drop somebody a word maybe somebody who's not doing well and they look to you and you failed them because you didn't mention anything about Jesus And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. You remember a time when Jesus appeared to the disciples after his death? There was one person missing. 
And when the disciples told him about what had happened, he said, oh, no way. No way. I'm not going to believe until I can put my fingers in the nail holes and my fingers in his side. We all know who that was, Thomas. And one day, Jesus showed up and said, Thomas, here's my hands. Here's my side. And Thomas believed. But you know what? He said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Is that us? Have we seen the personal appearance of Jesus Christ? Anybody? I've, raise your hands if you've personally seen Jesus Christ. We haven't, and yet we're here this morning. We believe. about the story we call the Great Commission. After Jesus rose from the dead, Matthew's Gospel tells us, then eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has appointed for them, and they saw him and worshipped him, but some doubted. Now let me, let me in all reverence say this, if I was writing that story, I was Matthew. I don't think I'd have put in there apostles doubted. Why would you do that? Why would you put apostles doubted in there? I wouldn't have. But it was led by the Holy Spirit to put that in. Why? So we could understand. So we could understand what? Unbelief. Let's just stew on that for a minute. And he said, Jesus speaking, said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the edge of the end of the age. He's with us always. You know, all this teaches me something, and I hope it's going to teach you something. When I have doubts about Jesus, when I have doubts about his power, when I have doubts with my faith, what should I do with those doubts? And you can say, throw them away. Lay, him at, lay them at the feet of Jesus Christ where they belong. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What happens when we don't do that? Well, we harbor doubts about Jesus. We end up closing our hearts to him. We stop going to him in a spirit of dependency. How many of you depend on Jesus? When we come to Jesus with doubts in our hand, bring him to his feet and pray and ask for his help. And what happens? That's when the evil one, the devil, shrieks, No, no, I'm losing. I'm losing these people. Amen. Well, let's look at this passage. It kind of illustrates some things about the challenges to our faith. The things that might keep us from coming to Jesus in times of need. Going to him often seems, at first, to make things worse. How can that be? How can going to Jesus make things worse? Well, this boy couldn't walk. He couldn't get up on his own. He couldn't come to Jesus on his own. What had to be done? He had to be taken to Jesus. So the father brought him to Jesus. And Mark tells us, then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Now we don't, it, it's hard to say who he was. They brought he and he saw Jesus. It could have been the boy. It could have been the demon seeing through the boy's eyes. But he threw the boy on the ground at the sight of Jesus. What did the apostles do? Do you know what the apostles were faced with when they tried to cast out this demon? 
the same thing. What do you think they did when, when this, this child was doing this? They were in fear because they didn't handle it. What did they do? They tried to do something their way, and it didn't work. And Jesus said in verse 25, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, and come out of him and enter him no more. See, that demon was using that young boy as a dwelling. That demon could come and go as he pleased, and nobody could do anything about it. And it wouldn't leave him willing. And the apostles tried and failed. Does sickness make a home in you? Physical sickness? Maybe mental sickness? Does it make a home in you? Do you allow it to make a home in you? Do you allow the bad things of this world to dwell inside of you? Do you allow that? I know I do. There's times when I allow those evil things to dwell in my heart. What are we supposed to do? There was a man who had a whole legion of unclean spirits in him. And Jesus commanded that whole legion of spirits to come out of him. You know, brothers and sisters, I believe we should learn to expect when we come to Jesus in our times of desperation, and especially in the times of doubt, that we better be prepared because the devil's going to work overtime. When we turn to Jesus, Satan's not happy. Satan's not happy with you right now. To the parents of those 4 H's, Satan's not happy with you at all. Be prepared. Be prepared to turn to Jesus in times of need. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7. One of my new favorite scriptures. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Sometimes God doesn't seem to answer our prayers, does he? This has been very frustrating for this father. Years and years of getting, trying to get help for his son. And his son's just wallowing and having convulsions and nobody can help. Can you imagine your own child or your own mother, your own father, suffering for years and years, and you take them to doctors and you take them to whatever, and they fill them full of man's drugs, and you're trying to, that's how you're handling it? And what did, so when he finally brings that child to Jesus and says, help us, what did Jesus do right away? What did Jesus do? Did he help him right away? Was it instantaneous? Jesus asks him a question. How long has this been happening to him? Okay. I'm kind of aggressive. I'm kind of outspoken. If that had been me standing there over my child and Jesus says, hey, how long has this been going on? I'd have said, Jesus, just heal him. I'll tell you later all the details. He needs help. He needs healed right now. And don't say you wouldn't either. Don't say you wouldn't do that. Don't say you'd be saying to the doctor, heal him right now. Get him healed. When you go to the hospital, yeah, you got to give some details. But if that person is in that dire of straits, you just want it taken care of right now. And that's what this dad did. He wanted it taken right now. And Jesus asked him a question. And Jesus eventually threw that spirit out. And an important lesson I learned while studying this is that I don't take my problems and my ills and my 
issues to Jesus and expect them fixed in my time and my way on my principles. I want him to fix them on my schedule right now because I'm so darn busy. I know people who refuse to wait. They get so busy trying to figure out ways and instead of using Jesus as a last resort, he's kind of an afterthought. He's kind of like, I go to church. I read the Bible. You know, I go to Christian counselors. I go to Christian doctors and nothing is helping. You know, I believe that he let this dad stew for a couple of moments to get his dad thinking on how long this has been going on and how much time he wasted instead of turning to Jesus right away. I firmly believe in healing. I firmly believe that Jesus can do it right now, right here and right now. But it's not by his, my will. It's by his will. This father was disappointed by past frustrations and I think we can fall in that category of oh here I go again here we go again I tried this before and it didn't help again I've tried church go to church every Sunday that ought to fix me I went to the doctor I have a really good doctor in Junction I went to the doctor man I'm still feeling terrible I sat with brothers in, in the back room and they prayed on me. I'm still feeling bad. Why is that? What about these apostles? What, what, why did they fail? They fail the same reasons that we fail. They were trying to do something on their own and not with the power of Jesus. And I'm not saying they should have been out doing things. They had gone out and healed some people. But I think their pride was getting in their way. We do that, don't we? We put our trust in things other than Jesus first. Back in my day, I, I put my trust in body armor to protect me. I put my trust in being able to shoot better than other people. I put my trust in the ambulance folks that finally came and put me on a gurney and took me to the hospital, and I trusted the doctors to take care of me and make me better. Not once did I put my trust in Jesus Christ, but you know what? He was there every moment, and he's the reason I stand right here this morning. We all have stories of where Jesus took us from and brought us to. Do we forget those stories? Some people do. Some people forget. Some Christians forget where they were brought from and brought to. They forget that they were healed. We go on with our daily lives. The Lord wipes away the pain and we just go on. Do we thank him? Do we take that time to thank the Lord for healing us? Only Jesus should be thanked, and only him should we look to trust. This poor man had nothing else. He laid his son before Jesus and said, if you can do anything, please. And Jesus said, if you can believe all things, things are possible to him who believes. Everything is possible to him who believes. Simply believe. It's like Jesus is quoting the man's words back to him. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible to him who believes. Jesus 
just keeps making our faith in him the key issue. There's no question that Jesus can do whatever we ask. There's no question. And there shouldn't be a question in your minds. Believe on him, in him, and wait on him to do what needs done. But I, if I step on your toes for believing something today, I'm trying not to. Far too often we believe in F-A-I-T-H. That we believe in a word. Jesus Christ is in a word. We put faith in that airplane pilot to get that bird off the ground. We put faith in getting up in the morning and that coffee pot works. Yesterday I had faith that I, my wife opened a can of beans and there was actually pork and beans in the can. Faith is a word. Faith in Jesus Christ is a lifestyle. Our faith in him requires more of his help than we originally thought. We are told that all things are possible to those that believe. It's not a question of can he do that? It's a question of how much do we trust him to do that? That's when we should really begin to realize how much we should be depending on Jesus Christ for everything. When we become become dependent upon him, that's when he has us right where he wants us. Jesus wants us dependent our whole lives on him, everything. Jesus is going to fix it. He's going to take care of your health. He's going to take care of your finances. He's going to take care of your relationships with people. If you have children that don't speak to you right now, I lay that at Jesus' feet. If you have family members who've gotten distant from you, lay that at Jesus' feet. In his time, in his way, it will be taken care of. Let me close with a passage from the book of Lamentations. It's found quite literally in the center of the book. And you know, a book that's full of sadness and griefs in general, this is a a bright ray of sunshine. Let me read this to you from the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, are we waiting on the Lord? Do we put everything in his hands? Or do we try to do it ourselves? That Jesus is just over here. Do we come to him in good times as well as bad? Just food for thought. He doesn't want us just when things get bad. All the time, Francis. All the time. This man shows us a very important story here. And it's a true story. The best and most effective place to go whenever we have doubts about the sufficiency of Jesus is right to the feet of Jesus. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day today, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for everything in this church this morning, Lord. The presence of the Holy Spirit was here, Lord, from the very beginning to the young people. That was just incredible to me, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for the word today, Lord. We hope that it touches somebody's life in some way, that they come to know that there's nothing other than Jesus Christ, that he is our everything, and that we need to lay everything at Jesus' feet, Lord. We just thank you for for the day. I ask that everybody goes home safely and soundly, and we come back next week to enjoy more word from you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You are... Sure.
going to do that right now. 